Hello there, we're from Sixth Sense Theatre. Uh, my name's Joe. And my name's Claire. And we're here to do uh, our very special play, which is called The Pig Town Kids, which is set during the First World War as part of the uh, centenary here in 2014. Uh, I'm going to be playing the part of Henry, who's our central character. We're telling the story of Henry. And I'm playing all the other parts in Henry's story. <laughs> you have always dreamed of. Your wish is our command. And these aren't any old chips. These chips have been lovingly deep fried by Henry King and his daughter Margaret. Cook King chips for the good people of Swindon. Henry King, the king of chips. That's me. Really, the chip shop you've always dreamed of. <laughs> but you'll all have your own dreams for the future. You might dream about being a footballer, an inventor, maybe even prime minister one day. <laughs> but a chippy was always my dream. And not just mine, it was our dream. Me and Wilf, my best friend. And this is the story of how that dream came true. I'll go back and start at the beginning. First thing I can remember is January 1st, 1900 and nothing. The dawn of a new century. I'm four. <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> it was a long time ago. Should old acquaintance be forgot? <laughs> I never brought to my mother let me stay up late to watch the New Year's fireworks. Later than I'd ever stayed up before. Everyone was happy and excited, just waiting for the clock to tick round to twelve and herald the first moment of the 20th century. So oh, happy new year! Happy new year! <laughs> Are you excited to see the fireworks, Henry? Yes! There'll be all sorts of pretty colours, but they're ever so noisy. When the whizzers and the bangers go off, you mind you don't jump out of your skin. <laughs> Mom! Why did you start without me? Sarah Richard, my brother, three years older than me. First big rocket went off. Uh, and Richard was howling! <laughs> Not me, though. I just stood and stared at all the lovely colours. I, I wasn't afraid of the loud bangs. I couldn't hear them. There was something wrong with my ears. I thought the sort of muffled way that I heard sounds was normal. I thought that was the way the world sounded to everyone. So I took no notice. Neither did anyone else. Not for years. Not even when I went to school. Bad 
here it can make life tricky at times, especially in Miss Parkin's class. Trumpet was not an easy task. 
we didn't have a lot of money. <sighs> Please! Oh, what will happen? You'll play it for five minutes, then you'll get fed up. Because it's too hard, and it will just sit on the shelf, collecting dust. I'll pay for it myself. With what? I'll earn money. How are you going to earn money? I, I don't know yet, but I will. I'll tell you what. If you can earn a penny, well then I'll give you a penny. If you can earn a shilling, then I'll give you another to go with it. That way, if you can keep it up, we'll have paid half each. Well, how does that sound? <laughs> that sounded like a challenge. And I like a challenge. How was I going to do it? Hmm. I joined Boys Brigade anyway, even though I didn't have an instrument. <laughs> we used to walk down Rodburn Road, past the GWR works on our way to St Mark's. If it was dinner time, you'd usually see Wilkes' Uncle Dennis out by the gates on his break. <laughs> Half past twelve, the hooter would blow. You'd hear it all over Swindon. Hi, Kinner House Tricks! Ooh, not too bad, Mr. Cook. Thank you for asking. Where's our wolf today? I'm meeting him at St. Mark's. What's wrong with your leg? Uh, dropped a great piece of steel on it last week. Well, shouldn't you be off work? I can't afford to be. Hey, have you got yourself a trumpet yet? I'm saving, but it's going to take some time. Well, keep at it. Good things come to those who wait. I hope so. We could be waiting here all day, though, and still get no dinner. Why not? I can't walk to the chip shop with this foot. <laughs> I'll go for you. Would you? Yeah, no problem. Oh, there's a little chippy in the next street. Nip round and get us card and chips, will you? And Henry? There's a hate in it for your trouble. I soon found out there were lots of hungry workers who'd happily pay me a little bit of commission to fetch their chips for them and save them time wasted standing in the queue. And that was how I paid for my first dented instrument. Not a trumpet, <laughs> but an old trombone. Oh. It was the cheapest in the shop. <laughs> Mum kept her word and paid for half. I practiced as much as I could, and over time, I got better. This is me, age 10. Now, so it's time to leave school. 
28th, 1914, is a day that will live long in history. It was my 18th birthday. <laughs> but that's not the reason this day will be remembered. Thousands of miles away, in a city I'd never even heard of, the leader of an empire I knew nothing about was being driven through the streets in a motor car when shots were fired. Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife were killed, and Europe began the slide towards war. In Swindon, we knew nothing of this at the time. <laughs> We had a party for my birthday! We ate cake and went sad songs! We didn't know the world was about to change forever. But it did. On August 4th, Britain declared war. And something very strange happened in Swindon. <laughs> sounded ten times to announce that we were at war. Were people afraid? Uh, upset? Depressed? <laughs> Not in the factory they weren't. When the horror sounded and we knew this was it! We're at war! Everyone in the wheel shop started cheering and clapping! Cheering? Are you joking? Why not cheer? We finally get to show the Hun who's boss! Well, that's not exactly a good thing. Have a bit of pride, Henry. You have to stand up to the bullies. You of all people should know that. But soldiers are going to be killed. They'll be doing their duty. Besides, it's got to be over by Christmas. Well, that's what they say. And how do they know that? Well, they do. And that's why I'm volunteering tomorrow. What? I'm going to join up. I don't want to miss it! Yeah, what about your friendship? Mom will take me back when I come home, I'm already asked. Have you thought this through? There's a big world out there, Henry. <laughs> Swindon's not the centre of the universe. And this is the chance to see it. But you don't have to go joining the army to do that! In your whole life! What's the furthest you've ever been out of Swindon? Chippenham. <laughs> you've never even been out of the county, never mind the country. No, no, I have, I forgot. I went to Western once to see the seaside. Well, I'm going to see the seaside. And when I get there, I'll be put on a ship. And then I'll see France. Belgium and Germany? Who knows where I'll end up? Maybe Timbuktu? Maybe the moon? I'm going to the recruiting office tomorrow. Why don't you come too? I'm not sure. The Henry I... King and Country. Come on, man. <sighs> I did. My best pal was joining up. I couldn't let him go on his own. Wilf went to see the recruiting officer first. And then it was my turn. So you want to join the British Army, do you? Uh, yes, sir. Nip? Henry King, sir. Age? 18. In June, just gone, sir. Was that your pal I saw just before? Uh, Wilfred Cook, yes, sir. Are you a bandsman as well? Yes, sir. A trombone, sir. Well, there's always room for a good musician in the army. Any 
physical, or oh, mental disabilities we should be aware of? No, sir. You need to complete a series of tests to find out if you're the right material. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. The tests were tough. Well, get ready. through a week later. I delivered it to my own house. <laughs> Although, I didn't open it till I got home from work that day. Oh, don't take it too badly, Henry. It's not fair. I passed all the other tests. They should take me. You can try again in a few months' time. My hearing isn't going to get any better, is it? Well, maybe it's for the best. How do you mean? Well, you'll be safe. I don't want to be safe. I want to serve. I want to be part of it. Yeah, it's not fair if you're right. So when do you go? Well, I start basic training in three weeks' time. <laughs> You'll be off to see the world. Not to begin with. The training's at Chiseldon Camp, about six miles away. I deliver a post there. Oh, you might see me on the parade ground. Oh, you might see me with my stupid post bag. Oh, chin up, mate. It won't last long. And then I'll come home. And everything will go back to normal. Everything did go back to normal for me. Wilf was off learning how to dig a trench, fix a bayonet, and fire a rifle. I was stuck, trudging up and down the streets and country lanes delivering boring letters. It wasn't fair. My stupid ears. After 15 weeks of basic training, Wilf was a professional soldier, ready to be shipped off to the Western Front. The day before he was due to be deployed to France, I walked up to the camp at Chiselden to see him. Hello, Henry. Hello, Will. Thanks for coming to see me off. 
I brought something for you. I thought you could use it as a diary. Write about all the exciting things you're getting to do, so you can tell me about them when you get back. Thanks, pal. So, when do you leave? Tomorrow morning. And, and where are they sending you? Well, we go by ship to France. After that, it's all secret. Oh. Well, good luck. And you? You don't need luck on a postal route. Eh, uh, you might get bitten by a dog or chased by a cow. Yeah, not quite the same level of danger as a German sniper <laughs> or an artillery round. Listen, I've been thinking. About what? Well, when it's finished, and I come home, I don't want to go back into the factory. Why not? You were right. That hooter was controlling my life. Now I got officers barking orders and telling me what to do from the minute I wake up. I want to be in charge for a change. The chip shop. Exactly. I want in. I can do all the engineering and design. Well, you better get on and win the war, sharpish. And then we can talk. Won't be a problem. <laughs> Ta-ta. The next day I watched Will and the rest of his newly trained platoon march out of Chiseldon. They sang, It's a long way to Tipperary. And you could still hear it faintly, even after they disappeared from view. Meanwhile, in Belgium, thousands of people had lost their homes. So that was the front line. It wasn't safe to be there. Excusez-moi, monsieur. Many Belgians came to live in Swindon. You could soon hear French being spoken on the streets. I learned a little bit on my daily round. Et quel est le nom de cette ville? Uh, ici. Oui? Ici, est appelle. Cochonville. Au revoir. Cochonville. Pig town. That's what I called it now. When I was growing up, I loved Swindon, but now I was trapped here. I wasn't allowed to go with my pals to fight, so I started to hate the place. I was a Pigtown kid, stuck in a pen that I couldn't get out of. And Pigtown was changing too. Chiseldon was now a major base for the basic training of new recruits. Scots, Irish and Welsh soldiers came to the town with their different accents, traditions and songs. After I finished my round, I would take my trombone into the pub where the soldiers gathered and play along with some of their songs. <laughs> doing my rounds, delivering the post to all three times a day. The factory hooter still went every morning, afternoon and evening. Although, they weren't only making trains there now, they were making ammunition and, and artillery for the war effort too. Wilf's uncle Dennis was still there though. They said he was too old to volunteer. I can't arouse tricks. Oh. Hello, Mr. Cook. I uh, heard they want to take you for the army. Not fit for duty. Well, that's rough. So I'm stuck in Pigtown delivering posts. Hey, it's an important job, Ma. You reckon? Well, think about it. Our the families here must know someone on the front. Those letters don't get delivered. How are they going to know their loved ones are all right? I bet there's loads of mail from the boys over there. Yeah, that's true. See, you're part of the war effort. 
It's not your fault your hearing's bad, is it? But we all have to do what we can. I suppose. I'm exactly the same. What do you mean? Well, half the apprentices from the wheel shop have gone. There's dozens volunteered from the railway works. Oh, I'd have done it myself, but they reckon I'm too old to fight. I said to the fella, Give us a rifle and we'll soon see who's too old. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't having it. So, I'm stuck in pig town. Just like you. And how are you part of the war effort? Well, I'm making wheels for military vehicles now. Not for civilian trains. I'm doing my bit. Yeah, good for you. It's not the same, mind. We're so short-handed, they've even got women working in there. Imagine that. Women working with iron and steel. <laughs> the world's going for me. It's a mad world. <laughs> Ah. Hey, Kidder, nip round and get us a bag of chips, will you? I might not be a soldier at the front, but I still had an important duty. People were desperate for news, and a letter from the front was the best news a family could get. That meant that their loved one was safe and well. For that day, at least. I am the postman, walking through Swindon. From Cheney Manor, and out onto Morden. <laughs> Letters to mothers from soldiers in trenches, telling them all about their adventures. <laughs> Letters to sweethearts, which ask, do you miss me? <laughs> Sealed with kisses and sign yours truly. <laughs> for things to be sent, which are not supplied by the government. <laughs> Warm winter woolies and razors and sweets, bottles of brandy and cold preserved meats. <laughs> Letters that speak of the highly commended, of the heroes of battle, medals intended. this one. The telegram. Misery filled. Saying, your husband, father, son, has been killed. The war dragged on. It wasn't over by Christmas. Or Easter. And the longer it dragged on, the more people got hurt. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mrs. Eileen Cook, and I'm a matron at the military hospital here at Chiseldon Camp. We have been in operation since June 1915, and we are receiving ever higher numbers of casualties from the Western Front. Some of the injuries sustained by the troops here are truly shocking. Modern warfare is an unforgiving, brutal and merciless exercise. But the human spirit and will to survive is equally remarkable. There are many brave boys here fighting for their lives and we do our best to aid them to victory. Thank you. Hello, Mrs. Cook. Oh, hello, Henry. <laughs> Busy day. We've got a new intake of nurses. I'm introducing them to life here at camp. <laughs> Is there anything for me? Ooh. One today. Oh, thank goodness. I haven't heard a dicky bird from Wilf for nearly three weeks. Oh. No one in. He's probably been far too busy to write. <laughs> oh, I'll read it to you. <laughs> Can you believe that? Well, <laughs> it, it must be.
must have been full of top secret information. Well, the censor has nothing better to do than to stop people from communicating with their own mothers. <laughs> My dearest mother, the weather has been blank, blank, blank. I am well, and we are all blank, 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 yesterday. Don't forget that I blank, 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 blank. Oh, keep smiling. <laughs> Your loving son, Wilf. <laughs> He's well. That's good. They're getting worse. Before long, when a letter arrives, it'll just be black ink from top to bottom. He's well. He says so. <laughs> yes. We must count our blessings. <laughs> Thank you. When the censor wasn't so extreme, Will wrote home to tell us all what a wonderful place France was. I believed every word of his letters. I didn't realise that what he wrote home to his mother and what he was really experiencing were two different stories. My dearest mother, France is the most beautiful country. The weather has been warm for the time of year, and the hedgerows are full of spring flowers. The rain hasn't stopped falling for four days. There is six inches of stinking water at the bottom of our trench. My feet haven't been dry for a month. The locals are very pleased to have us here. They bring gifts of cheese and bread when we go past their houses. Don't worry, no one has given me any warning. Oh, there's been heavy fighting all around. The Germans shelled our position all night. It was impossible to sleep. And the poison gas in the air left you gasping for breath. We have everything we could want for. And I feel very safe with the brave company of lads I share my trench with. If you get the chance to send socks, I would really appreciate it. I'm cold and hungry and miserable and scared. Though my feet are frozen, I dream about having a dry pair of socks. Your ever-loving son, well, quite a bit since you've been away. But the hooter still blows and there's still post to be delivered. <laughs> I 
how's France? Is it still as beautiful as ever? What are you saying? In your letters. You said it was beautiful. It's not beautiful. Not anymore. I brought my trombone. I thought maybe we could play something together. No. Come on. You, your mum said you needed to tune up. I don't want to hear anything. Right, I don't want to hear anything. Just the breeze blowing. And the bees and the flowers. I'll sit with you for a bit. I'd rather be on my own. Oh. Well. Bye then. Goodbye. Don't forget what you said. What was that? When it's all over, and you come home, you're going into business with me. I haven't forgotten. Really? I think about it all the time. I've been saving. I've got loads of ideas about the van. Well, tell me about some no. of them. Not yet. Not till it's over. Well, hurry up and win the war, and we can get to work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I must get on with that. When do you have to go back? Two days time. Take care of yourself. I will. Henry? Yeah. Thanks for coming over. Henry, you 
You shouldn't be out here. There's restrictions. I'm working. If the police catch you, they'll lock you up. I was in the sorting office this that morning. That is not worth the risk, you know. I was doing a favour for Victor Wolford. Uh, he got me on. my postman. I came across something. Was everything all right, Henry? Telegram. For me? I thought I should be the one to deliver it. In person. What to do with this? Feels like a bomb's going to go off when I pull it open. Who oh, open it for me? Read it. I regret to inform you that a report has been received from the War Office to the effect that Private Cook W was posted missing on 3rd of August. I must get back to work. Is there anything I can do, Mrs. Cook? Go and find my boy and bring him home so I can bury him. It doesn't say he's been killed. It says here, he's listed as missing. I let him think I don't know what it's like out there. It gave him some comfort. But I do know his letters about the beautiful countryside and the lovely weather were all lies. In the hospital, we get a hundred young men like my wealth every day. They're ruined. All of them. Even if their bodies heal, they're scarred by the terrible things they've seen. And will never be the same again. Any of them. won't be coming back. He's dead. I know it. God rest his poor soul.
comes to the battle. They were young, straight of limb, true of eye, steady and aglow. They were staunch to the end against odds uncounted. They fell with their faces to the foe. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we, we will, will remember them. I lost my job as a postman soon after. Couldn't bring myself to go to work. I felt so sad for Wilf, and so guilty that I hadn't been there with him. All those brave boys that gave their lives in the defense of their country and... The war ended in 1918. On the 11th day of the 11th month, an armistice was signed to end the hostilities. Four years of carnage, with millions of young soldiers killed, came to an end. Some people cheered and put flags up. I didn't think it was anything worth celebrating. Nearly everyone in the country had known someone who'd gone off to battle and never come back. your job at the post office. There's no news about Wilf. He's still listed as missing. But one of his pals sent me this. I thought you might like to take a look. It's the book I'd given Wilf all that time ago. It wasn't a diary. Instead, it was full of plans for the future. What he was going to do when he got back from the war. <laughs> there were sketches galore of the mobile chip shop. The ideas for heating the oil in the fryers. And the best kind of potatoes to use. <laughs> There's even a little bit of music he'd written. A little ditty he called... Cook. King. Chip. Who's going to play it on his trumpet to mark the first frying? And that was when I realised I couldn't let the dream die. I had a duty to Wilt's memory to make it come true. So I worked really hard, saved up my money, studied Wilt's plans, and I started to build the first mobile fish and chip shop. Complete with wheels? serving hatch and a blackboard for the menu and when she was old enough my daughter Margaret helped out as well didn't you Margaret? Indeed I did dad <laughs> <laughs> it took time and it took effort <laughs> but we got there eventually and the first thing I did was I paid for a sign to be painted so that everyone in town would know the name of the mobile fish and chip shop <laughs> Fish and chips! Get it! <laughs> Roll up, ladies and gentlemen, for Cook King's Fish and Chip Emporium, Swindon's very first 
mobile takeaway food facility. We have everything that discerning palates could possibly require. We got small chips, we got large chips. Crispy bits. <laughs> and these aren't any old chips. These chips have been lovingly deep fried by Henry King. Cook King chips for the good people of Swindon. <laughs> so, we all finished here then, Margaret. I believe we are. <laughs> Time to move out. Find more hungry mouths to feed. Tell more people Will's story. You won't be forgotten. Dad? Mm? There is one more thing. What's that? Will's music. You're right. <laughs> Cook King Chips. <laughs> He was going to play it to celebrate the first batch of chips we could fry. <laughs> only, he never got to hear it played for real. You can only imagine it in his head, while the bombs were going off around him. And that's the real pity of it. All those dreams imagined by all those young soldiers that never had the chance to come true. Margaret plays trumpet now, and I like to hear Will's music. And I also like to think that he can hear it somehow. <laughs>